There is a th common thread to all of my research, and that's magnetic fields on stars. Um, I study low mass stars and brown dwarfs. My field of specialty is the aurora. My research or research interests are in supernovae and supernova cosmology. I study the sun, and I study the sun as a star. What I particularly work on is the interaction of the solar wind with Earth's magnetic field. And my research focuses on the interstellar medium and understanding the chemical composition of the ISM. I'm a space plasma physicist, which means I study the particles, the energetic and, and thermal particles that are in the Earth's natural environment. I'm interested in active galactic nuclei, and these are the bright centers of galaxies. These galaxies have a black hole at their center, and they're being fed by gas and material falling into the black hole. I did um, studies in coronal physics. So I'm interested in questions like how did our Milky Way galaxy form and come to be the way that it appears today? Well, I think the main difficulty in diversifying physics and the physical sciences is the lack of prior examples. When, when people look at phys physicists, they mostly see white males. This is changing somewhat now, but that's well, certainly when I was growing up, that was very much what one saw. And so it didn't look like something, it wasn't obvious on the face of it that that was something you would do uh, since you saw nobody like you doing it. Of course, they always ask, what's your major? And I say physics, and they go, you don't look like a physics major. <laughs> I always kind of took that as a compliment. <laughs> but it, it is. You don't look like a physics major because everybody has an idea in their mind what a physics major looks like. I still sit in large, in rooms full of people, you know, 100, 200 astronomers where I'm the only, not just the only uh, black woman in the room, I'm the only black person in the room. So I live in Upper Manhattan. I, I walk to work. It's about a 10 minute walk to my office. And on that walk, black people disappear. So when I walk out of my building, I'm surrounded by black and brown people. 10 minutes later, when I walk into my office building, they're vanished. There are a few people on the custodial staff, there are a few department administrators, but there are no faculty. There are very few postdocs. And there are a smattering of grad students. But the contrast is really noticeable to me uh, because you know, the world I live in in the world I work in, completely different. Uh, yeah, you, you felt very much out of place. <laughs> there, there was nobody else. I, w I was certain. I, it was true f for most of my life. I, actually, I was really the only black guy in the room. If you're underrepresented, you can see that you're not fully represented in this population. So you have to wonder why, you know, why am I here? Uh, how did I get in here? By my senior year, I was the only one in my quantum, the only woman in my quantum physics class. And I remember at that point thinking, is there, some, is there something wrong with me? Like, and what's interesting is when you're, the only, when you're the only of something in a room, it's, it's like excruciatingly obvious. I think one of the biggest barriers for me has been feeling like I belong in astronomy, feeling like I have a place here. In astronomy, a lot of people go through imposter syndromes. Um, but I think it's more prevalent when you're a part of an underrepresented minority than, than when, you're, when you're not. Because there's that additional, you know, why am I the only one in the room sort of thing. And uh, who do I go to to talk about um, my level of discomfort? Um, who do I go to to just ask general questions? I, I don't want to seem like the idiot when, when I'm asking, when I don't know why a microwave works. Uh, <laughs> I experienced a good deal of stereotype threat, what is, what is now understood as stereotype threat, uh, feeling like as the only person in the room, you know, I really needed to do well. Uh, and if I didn't do well, that would reflect on all African Americans. Um, and that puts pressure on you. You're unconscious mostly about it, but uh, in retrospect, as I look back at 
decisions I made and, and the way I felt about things, I, I can see that that was, that was operating uh, quite a bit. You had to deal with things that weren't, uh, well, black, for example. So in a way, you're, you become kind of a misfit in your own society, but then you get into other societies. A lot of your colleagues are, are well, white people, and because you don't fit there really either. So it's like you kind of don't fit in, in either society and you kind of live in your own. What I have noticed in, in the US, in Australia, and in Russia is the fact that many of the scientists believe that Hispanic or black are inferior in the way that they think. So it's not that you're not capable to do something, but you're certainly inferior in your knowledge, even when you demonstrate that you're not. We've been looking at this for several years, and we certainly see male PIs have an advantage in getting proposals accepted. Being a, a Latina woman in astronomy um, has been a challenge at times. So he said, so what brings you here? I hear you want to be an astronomer. And I said, well, I do, but I just talked to this other professor and he said I should go into physics first. So that's, that's what I'm going to do next. And he goes, well, I really think that I need to be honest with you and tell you that women can't do physics. And you can try but you're gonna fail, and you might not want to go that route. I remember my first a and class, and uh, the professor, the first test, he passes it out, and he said, this test will separate the men from the boys. And there's one other girl and, and I in this class, and we kind of looked at each other and went, which one do you want to be, a man or a boy? So, so I aced that class. I mean, that made me want to beat every single one of them, and I did. And it turned out I was the only woman in the room of about 200 people. <laughs> it was huge imbalance, and there was most, most of these people were, were military officers and researchers. And this elderly general or colonel, I don't know what his rank was, saw me as the young woman in the room and just assumed I was a secretary and came right up and said, I need X number of copies of, of some documents. And I had to show him my badge saying I was a presenter. So I applied to a job back east at the Goddard Space Flight Center. And I was there being interviewed by a couple of people. And one of them was from industry that was a contractor to NASA and the other was a civil servant. And they were just asking me about my personal background and, um, you know, I was telling them that I was from Argentina and the person that worked in industry says, well, then, you know, my wife is from Chile and she always pours me coffee. So will you please get me a cup of coffee? And I just, my jaw dropped. Can I swear in this interview? <laughs> you know, that the guys do tend to speak over you or not really give you a chance to speak or, or don't pay attention to you, which is often frustrating. You know, you'll say something, they'll say something that was essentially what you just said, and they get the credit for it. <laughs> it happens. All these assumptions about my intelligence. And then I remember my math teacher in complex analysis, he had an office nearby, and this professor and I were once again in this argument about something, and um, my math teacher came out, and he knew how smart I was and totally supported me, and he was like, he said to this guy, no, Laura's really smart. You're not treating her like she's the, as smart as she is, and he said, well, I don't think she is as smart as you think she is. Like, this whole conversation is happening in front of me. I came from India, where I was never held back, never told that you can't do this because you're a woman, never. Then I came to USA and my start was at the University of Denver, very small school. And uh, there were 10 of us in graduate school. I was the only woman in my batch. And the very first year, I mean, that is the first time I 
ever felt discriminated uh, as a woman. You're losing so many voices that could contribute to what you're doing because you make it so hostile. And only the people who are yeah, stubborn, really want to get there, are willing to put up with it. And it shouldn't be that way. A diversity as a value is something that almost everybody will reflect back to you positively. The changes that uh, are required to act on that value have not really penetrated our community in the way that they, they need to. And that's because a lot of those changes make a lot of people uncomfortable. They're not easy. They require doing things very differently from the way um, we've done them in the past. Do we, do we change the people to fit the mold? Or do we change the mold to fit the people? So what we think is an unconscious bias, we tend to try to correct through making proposals more anonymous. So that we really are, when we get into the discussion in the panels about how good this proposal is, it's centered on the science that it's proposing and not the team that's proposing it. At headquarters, when we try to put together committees, advisory committees or science committees or, or review committees, we try and consciously look for diversity uh, in, in, in all ways, you know. And I think if more people do that at whatever level they are working to try and get, make a conscious effort to try and get people of, of different uh, diversities together to work, th that will help. So we've been doing things like changing the ethics codes for professional societies and making sure that people understand that we expect professional behavior and conduct at all conferences. And that has started to really fall into other parts of our industry as well in terms of science team meetings, industry workplaces. The standards are all starting to improve for really equitable, inclusive areas. Expanding participation is done one student at a time. You have to identify promising students. You have to open up opportunities for them. You have to mentor them and shepherd them along and make sure that they're doing what they need to do. And maybe they don't know what they need to be doing at various points because maybe they don't have that network of connections. They don't have that social capital to understand. And so they need special attention, people who are going to keep an eye out for them and help them along. Giving unconscious bias training um, to professors to assess uh, their, their behaviors and their practices um, and what implications that can be having in their classroom. Because I think a lot of professors, they don't realize that some of the things that they're doing are, are having um, uh, disproportional impacts on, on minority groups. One of the places where a lot of this discussion has been happening recently has been around graduate admissions. And there's clearly a lot of work that still needs to be done to get people to recognize the problems with using standardized test scores, with over-relying on famous people's letters of recommendation, with you know, discounting transcripts from smaller, less known institutions, um, generally with our entire admissions attitude to date. I don't think faculty should be allowed to hire faculty. So we just shouldn't be allowed to do searches? We're doing illegal searches. We have the data. We know exactly who gets hired. And we've seen that it isn't diverse. So why would we think that those same people can change somehow to result in a different outcome? Any faculty member that is making any kind of personnel decision has got to be following best practices with respect to hiring. If HR hasn't trained a committee or trained uh, an individual on how to do a search, they are doing a biased search. So without intervention, everybody is perpetuating the systematic um, underrepresentation of women and minorities. I think it means that we have to move towards uh, cohort hiring, so thinking of, uh, thinking of hiring in groups rather than hiring individually. And I think it means that we have to move towards uh, competing for lines across departments. We need to think more about what our collaborations look like 
and, and try and expand those to keep people in the pipeline. Not just bring them in initially and then let them flounder around trying to figure out what they're going to do, but actually, um, actually, you know, bringing them into the fold, thinking about their ideas, like really, um, really making sure that they stay in the field and are happy in the field. It should not be that when you think of scientists or when a, a little kid thinks of a scientist, they think of a crazy haired old white man. They should think of a woman or a person of color or many different things should pop into their mind. Astronomy and astrophysics is a lot of fun. I think being an astronomer is a great privilege and I would, I would never downplay how awesome it is that we get to spend time thinking about questions that are completely outside of the realm of normal human experience. Is there life somewhere else in the, the philosophical, the religious, the ethical, the ramifications of knowing if there's life somewhere else? are just enormous. Answering that age-old question that you, know, you think about when you're a kid laying under the stars and you see this vast universe in front of you, you know, are we alone answering that question? So that is very motivating. You're always trying to find out something that you didn't know yesterday. Um, and so there's always that curiosity. There's the wanting to know what, why, why is it like that? Every day is different. Every day has new challenges, um, new exciting ideas to think about, um, opportunities to learn, opportunities to help other people learn. Um, I love interacting with students. Um, I find it very rewarding. Um, I love their constant questions between them and my seven-year-old twins. I'm, you know, why, why, why? You know, I'm now accustomed to that. Um, I love working with this, you know, huge group of scientists around the world, um, sharing ideas with them and, and coming up with uh, new theories and models and observations that should be made. When you see something and you see something going on, the sun, and uh, you come to an understanding of something that's happening with a fair amount of confidence, and you realize that no one else in the world knows this <laughs> for that, that moment or for that period of time. Uh, so that, uh, that's uh, pretty thrilling. I'm an associate professor of astronomy at Columbia University. And I'm a professor in the astronomy department at UC Berkeley. I am a professor and chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Sonoma State University. I'm an associate professor at Hunter College of the City University of New York. I'm also a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm an associate scientist at the Space Telescope Science Institute. I am the director of the Heliophysics Division at NASA headquarters. And I'm an astronomer and visual artist. Staff astronomer here at Lick Observatory. I am a heliophysics program scientist at NASA headquarters. I am a program scientist at NASA headquarters. Research scientist or a planetary scientist. I'm the director of the Mariah Mitchell Observatory. I'm a professor in climate and space science and engineering. And I'm a professor of physics at the University of Texas at Arlington. I'm a solar physicist. And I am an associate astronomer at the National Optical Astronomy Observatory. I'm the head of communications, public outreach, and education for the National Solar Observatory. I'm an associate research scientist. I'm a professor of physics and astronomy at Rice University. I am a senior scientist. The astrophysicist, Marshall Space Flight Center. Observatory scientist at Space Telescope Science Institute. I'm a physicist. <laughs> You betcha! <laughs> I'm a physicist! <laughs>